So I'm testing the sound. Good morning, Barbara. I see you. Your name. Can you hear me? Well, good morning and welcome to our Tuesday morning sitting. And uh, I'm just uh, delighting in seeing all these names. Uh, good number of people that I well, I know. And um, it's been, um, and also the fact that already there are over 200 people uh, watching this, I imagine going to meditate with us is uh, phenomenally encouraging um, that people come together to meditate, that so many people are meditating at the same time. And of course, there are many more people around the globe who are meditating in this very time, very, very, very time uh, let alone different time zones, different times of morning. There are people who get up in the morning and they meditate, like those of us in California are doing here now. And uh, the idea that we meditate in community the idea that we meditate uh, with a shared intention, a shared practice, um, I think is very inspiring and, and certainly inspiring to me and uh, always gives me a lot of hope in uh, having so many people touching into themselves, touching into their hearts in the way that this mindfulness meditation does. So thank you for being here. And so, we will meditate. And... Uh, to take uh, your usual, maybe, or take a meditation posture and gently acknowledge that what you're about to do or what you are now doing, have a clear sense, clear, articulated, almost ritual acknowledgement to yourself that now you're going to be meditating. There is a tradition in Buddhism that whatever place that you're sitting at is your bodhi manda. The bodhi manda is a Pali Sanskrit term for the seat of awakening. In Bodhgaya, there's the bodhi manda where the Buddha became awakened. And to acknowledge now here where the place you're in on 
this is your place to meditate. This is the time and the place. And so, in this place, in this time, with the purpose of being present, a big part of what you'll be present for is your own experience. And to sit here knowing your experience as it's happening. Because we know that it's very valuable to really be in touch with, meaning to feel with your whole body, to be aware of, meaning to experience with your whole field of perception, awareness, the experience that you're having in the moment. That this personal experience of the moment is the doorway to wisdom, to compassion, and to freedom. And so as you sit here now, what is your immediate, direct experience of sitting here in a body? And as I like to say, what is the experience your body has of itself? So it's not so much that you're aware from the control tower in the head looking down, but a big part of the awareness is the awareness the body has, the way the body senses sensations, the pulsing, vibrating. warm and cold, heavy and light, expanding and contracting body. And if you take a few deep breaths, you will feel the expansion of the rib cage, the torso as you breathe in deeply. And as you exhale, you'll feel the settling of that, the contraction, the coming back in, and taking some deep breaths and riding on the waves of expansion and contraction of the torso. Letting the breathing return to normal. And as you do this meditation session, you might be a little extra alert, aware, that when you wander off in thought, get lost or preoccupied with thinking. Notice how when that happens, there's often a loss of our direct experience. There's a loss of being in touch with or sensing, feeling the physicality, the immediacy of what's happening in the mind, in the body. Notice that, give yourself back into, give yourself over to your body, the direct experience. And if there is thought, thinking, let it be in the wake, let it be a byproduct of experiencing things directly. And one way for that to happen is very gently quiet as a whisper in the mind to have a single word, a mental note, or a single phrase, field notes, 
describing what direct experience is, not to take you away from your experience, but to connect you to it. And, and at the center of it all, let there be the breathing, riding on the waves of inhale and exhale, one breath at a time.
if you find yourself thinking a lot, change how you're thinking from the thoughts that take you away from direct experience to thinking very simple mental notes, labels, the name, label, your direct experience. And do that naming of your direct experience in a very relaxed, soft way. Being content with whatever label comes up. It doesn't have to be accurate. Just to keep you connected, pointing you in the direction of the immediacy of direct experience.
And then as we come to the end of this sitting, there is a tradition in Buddhism of dedicating the merit of any practice event that we do. And to make this not just uh, an aspiration, you might consider from the vantage point of the end of this sitting and how you feel. How on this day, or if it's nighttime for you tomorrow, how can you make the world a little better place? How can the state that you're in now, if you're a little bit calmer, more settled, more aware, whatever, more patient, How could this, whatever is happening to you now, how could this provide a reference point for how you might benefit the lives of the people around you? May all beings be happy. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so this morning I'll continue with my discussions of the faculty of mindfulness the third of the five faculties. And, you know, I feel some ways I could probably talk about mindfulness for a very long time. And at the same time, I don't quite know what mindfulness is. I've been doing it for 40 years. So I have a sense of the practice of it. But to narrow what mindfulness is down to a particular thing, I haven't really found that particularly useful, though we'll get to kind of as we go through these days, my kind of understanding of what the essence, even so, of, or, the, of, or the potential, full potential of mindfulness. And, um, <clears throat> but uh, as I said yesterday, I want to make a distinction between the faculty of mindfulness and the practice of mindfulness. And the distinction could be, for example, the, the, someone could tell you that they run, and that doesn't tell you much. Some human beings can run, and it's just a capacity to run, and they're running. That's nice. But if they tell you that they're uh, a training to run, if they're doing a training program for running, then you have an idea that, that it's not just running, and now it comes with uh, strengthening and speed exercises and, um, you know, running in a particular way, a whole program that's involved with what it means to train. So in the same way, um, m- mindfulness training, mindfulness practice involves more than just uh, mindfulness. But the training of mindfulness, the tr- practice of mindfulness, its function is to strengthen mindfulness to strengthen that capacity, the faculty of mindfulness, so it becomes strongly established. It used to be that the four foundations of mindfulness were called the four foundations of mindfulness. Uh, Now the tendency is to call them uh, the four establishments of mindfulness, or uh, my preference is to translate it as the four ways of establishing sati. And so we have these practices that really kind of begin to establish and strengthen our capacity to be aware, to be attentive in a clear way in the present moment. And uh, one of the key elements of that helps with this establishment that is sometimes equated with mindfulness itself is uh, uh, recognition. The mind's capacity to comprehend what's happening to know what's happening. 
So if I'm breathing, I can know I'm breathing. Now I can go through much of the day and not really pay attention to my breath. And I'm breathing, but I don't, I don't really clearly know oh, that is breathing going on. I could hear a sound and I can just kind of know it in passing and hardly pay any attention to it. Or I could know oh, that's a sound. And I could really know it as a sound. I could recognize it. I can clearly comprehend that that's traffic sound or something. And so this ability to clearly recognize what something is. Um, and then uh, there's two words and related to, or two ways, slightly different ways that this is said by the Buddha. One is sampajana, Pali word, which usually translated as, I like to translate as clear comprehension. And then there's uh, pajanati, which is to know. And those two are kind of the key elements of the practice of mindfulness. And so um, one of the, and as we cultivate this clear recognition of what's here, then our capacity for awareness begins to grow. Our capacity to stay in the present moment and be aware of what's happening. It's kind of like it creates momentum or grounds us or connects us in a stronger way. The, uh, the capacity to understand what's happening is not a complicated analytical thing like all the causes and conditions of what's going on, but it's really the simple act of recognition that uh, is recognizing the specificity of what's happening in the moment. There's a clarity where things begin to stand out clearly and we make distinctions. I don't want to make this too analytical but I will offer an example. That if you say, if someone says to you, uh, they're having a bad day, um, that is a very broad judgment of the day. And it's kind of such a broad judgment that in a certain way, if that's how they're seeing the day, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's bad because that's what, how they, that through the eyes through which they're seeing it. But that's a broad, abstract concept. It, you know, we know what part of the day is bad. And you, you know, you're talking with them, you're walking down the street, and it's a sunny day and a blue sky and peaceful setting. And, um, and you look around and say, well, is this the bad part of the day? And they say, no, no, this isn't the bad part of the day. Um, what's the bad part of the day? Oh, the bad part of the day is that um, I'm having a lot of trouble with my boss at work. Um, oh, does that boss come with you when you go home in the evening? No, no, but the thoughts of it do. And so, by simple questions, we begin kind of separating out what's actually happening until the clearer and clearer we are moment by moment, uh, um, we see that we don't tend to generalize these big statements like it's a bad day. And at one point, as practice gets strong, uh, in the moment, the direct experience is what might be, here's a mind, my mind now is having the thought, this is a bad day. And to see clearly recognize, oh, that's a thought, thought, bad day, that puts it in a different context. It puts it as one of many different features of the present moment. There's body sensations, there's what I see physically around me, there's emotions, there's other thoughts that are going on, all kinds of things are going on. And to see each thing's in a specificity, not the generalization the mind can make, begins to uh, uh, certainly make us wiser to see what's going on and, and not to generalize, not to have these judgments that get caught up. Um, but also it starts to uh, highlight slowly more and more the value of staying clearly present and really seeing the details of the moment uh, as they arise, as they appear. And as we do that, uh, awareness, mindfulness gets established. We become clearer and clearer. And sometimes the, the language, the concept of clarity, uh, to see clearly, to know clearly, is uh, almost synonymous with the idea of being mindful. So in the training of mindfulness, one of the things we're doing is training ourselves to uh, begin to recognize the specificity of the moment. Not to dig in and dig underneath and do archeological digs to see what's going on, but uh, just to begin seeing 
what's happening in the moment. And it could be as simple as looking around where you are in the room or outside and just identifying individual things. Uh, I'm seeing a chair over there. I'm seeing a shelf over there, a door, a, a light switch. And that, even though it's kind of mundane and maybe not doesn't seem very spiritual, to, to uh, kind of look around and see and identify, for some states of mind, that's phenomenally useful. In fact, some therapists will do that exercise with people who are really caught up in their fear and their anxiety, uh, in their ideation. They'll actually ask them to look around, just name what they see in the room. And it's kind of grounding, it's settling. It begins creating the mind's capacity to start being clear of what's going on. And it might be, you know, seem silly to do that in a room, but when we close our eyes in meditation, we're doing the same thing. We're not sitting here thinking, you know, I'm having a bad meditation, I'm having a good meditation, or whatever we're saying. I'm, I'm a bad meditator, I'm a good meditator. These generalizations actually keep us removed from direct experience and interfere with our ability to establish mindfulness, establish awareness of the present moment. But if we can start recognizing the little bit that, you know, the details of the moment in a relaxed, open way and not searching or striving so much, but just noting the simplicity of the in-breath and the out-breath. Instead of saying, oh, I'm having a bad breath, uh, I'm breathing in a bad way, that's abstract. But to, oh, the, oh, the inhalation is like this. The exhalation is like this. The weight of my bottom against my cushion is like this. The sound of the traffic is like this. And so one of the ways this is done, that is optional, but is a long tradition of doing this, is using mental notes, little labels. And this is a beautiful art to learn. Uh, it takes a while to learn it. It's awkward at first. Some people protest too, too quickly and say it just makes their mind busy. But it's kind of like riding a bicycle that, um, you know, if at first it's wobbly and you fall off and it's awkward, it takes a lot of energy. But once you learn to ride the bike, it goes really smooth and easy. And then you lift your hands off the handlebar and look, look, I can, drive, I can bike without even holding a handlebar. So the same thing, as we get, if we give ourselves time to learn the art of mental noting and know how uh, it works best for us, our way, because we've tried different ways, then the very simple thing of just reckoning, oh, in-breath, out-breath, hearing, pressure, uh, thinking, warmth, contentment, that these very simple, you know, to make them so light, really quiet. One way that I like to do my mental noting, I don't always do it, but sometimes I find it phenomenally helpful, very useful, and I kind of love doing it. To make it really a light touch, I will um, uh, imagine I'm used doing the mental noting. And, um, and if I imagine I'm doing it rather than doing it in the mind's, you know, the mind's whisper in the mind, then it's almost like there's almost no energy involved in using the mental note. It's kind of like little, it floats through like a, you know, like, a, you know, like an imagine, like a vision or something. And, um, but it keeps me connected. So we don't have to use mental noting. We don't have to do this, but it's a way of kind of getting a hang of the clarity, the specificity, to really connect to what's the, the direct experience as opposed to the abstract concepts of the experience. And as practice settles down, 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 we are, uh, it's a natural thing as the mind becomes clearer and clearer to begin seeing more and more uh, details of phenomena. It's kind of like, you know, you've had a really good nap, you wake up in the afternoon, you're very clear. And everything seems kind of clear and precise and pristine because of the state of the mind. So as we can kind of cultivate this ability to clearly recognize the moment, this, 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 um, then awareness grows, mindfulness grows. The ability to stay clear moment by moment becomes stronger and stronger. So recognition is, uh, some people see it as the same as mindfulness. I'm treating it as a little bit different than mindfulness, 
but it's a partner to mindfulness. It's an I- integral part of mindfulness training. And, um, and it's an important part of this whole faculty of mindfulness that we're growing and developing. So, uh, so that's the second day. And uh, we have three more days on the faculty of mindfulness. And I'm very much looking forward to the chance of sharing these uh, ideas with you. And uh, so I want to thank you. And, um, and I hope that you're well. Um, I see someone says transmission was intermittent throughout. I've been told that um, YouTube and the internet is just packed these days with you know, everyone home and doing videoing, video conferencing, watching movies. So the system is quite burdened. And so that's maybe, maybe why in your neighborhood that um, it's uh, you know, maybe intermittent, I don't know. But what you can try to do is reduce the resolution in which your YouTube videos are coming in. So uh, until tomorrow, thank you all very much.